because when you read about the uh, what do you call it um the New England industries, when you read about this, things have changed. Most of those industries are no longer there, you know. So teach what is relevant, and then teach mostly about Ghana and other African countries, because that's more beneficial. I mean, if we teach our kids to love other nations and not to love Ghana, we are doing them a great disservice. You know, so I mean, I will teach what is reality, and then also, as I said, that I will uh, review the boarding school system and abolish it. Vocational education. Let's learn from the Germans. You know, the German system is very, very useful. They've left. I mean, they have led in auto industry. Why? They start early. You know, and also, I mean, people shouldn't. It shouldn't just be finishing high school and going to the university. You know, the vocational institutions should be built properly, such that if somebody, they become attractive to people, you know, when they finish, they start their own industries, so that they don't have to look at, I mean, government is not going to be able to solve any problem. I mean, governments don't solve problems, they create them, you know. So let's educate our people, say that they can, you know, create industries, their own industries, and employ people. You know, I mean, these industries don't have to be big ones. Even, you know, you start with employing maybe three, four people, and then you build upon it. I like Canada, Japan very much. You know, um, I'm, you see, I'm now doubling into Guinean politics. And it's because, you know, he's an industrialist. This guy employs people. I mean, I don't care about his politics, but what I care about is the fact that, you know, he actually employs people. And um, I like people who go into business so that they can help others. Yes, we go into academia, and we educate a lot of people, and that's a noble profession. But that alone is not enough. The reason Africa has problems is that we have, we do not have enough people in the private sector. You know, it's the private sector that develops, helps to develop a country, not, not government, no. Right, so now I'll go back again to the languages. Uh, you mm-hmm. said we should use our local language mm-hmm. in our educational system. Yes. But here lies the case when you finish schooling in Ghana, there's no job for you. You want to travel outside. And even, even though we use English as our medium of um, exchange, we still have to go all the way to write English tests <laughs> before we even get accepted in these foreign universities. So mm-hmm. if you say we should use our local language, how is it going to help us in that manner? Wonderful. Number one, we don't have to come here. And number two, if we want to come here, you know, the Japanese don't teach their people in English, they teach in Japanese. The Chinese teach their people in Chinese. They pass those English exams with distinction. You know why? Because they study in their own language. So cognitively, you know, they have their linguistic, uh, they, they, what do you call it, um, the area of the brain that is responsible for language, the frontal lobe, you know, is developed in such a way that they can learn another language. I'm not saying we shouldn't learn English at all. No, we should learn English, but our schools, our, all the subjects should be taught in a Guinean language, and then English should just be a subject, you know. And I could, let me tell you about a project that was done in 1979. It's called the Ile Ife Project, the Ile Ife Project. This was done in Nigeria. You know, they had two groups of students. One group was taught solely in Yoruba. The other group was taught solely in English. After several years, they took the same exams. Those who studied solely in Yoruba did better in all subjects than those who studied in English. I mean, several studies have been done to replicate it in all over the world. It's called the ELEFE project. What does that mean? What that means is that if you teach someone in the language they understand, they can comprehend things, they can comprehend complex concepts easily, than, or much easier than if you taught them in a foreign language. You know, those days we sang in the bleak midwinter, blah, 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 snow had fallen on snow. We didn't know what snow was. What business did we have singing about snow? Why didn't we sing about Pamatan? Because Hamilton was what we knew. You know, the, t- the point I'm trying to say here is that I remember when I first went to England and um, 
uh, what do you call it, by three o'clock, you know, it was autumn, they call it fall, it was dark. So I rushed to my uh, advisor's office and I said, John, what's happening? And then he began to laugh at me, he said, well, we, we, autumn has begun. Oh, okay. You know, and then this is this is snowed eventually. I'm like, oh dear, what is this? We sang about this. What business did we have singing about it? Do they sing about Africa? You know, did they sing about our Hamatan? Did they sing about our forests? No. It is colonialism and the neo-colonial mentality, you know, that is what is hurting us. That's what is hurting our educational system. You know, look at what is happening in these stupid places. They're replacing one foreign country, you know, uh, France with Russia. Or, that's totally stupid. Why don't you replace with an African concept? There's no, I mean, there's no country on earth that has done well, that has used another country's language. All the first, so-called first world countries, they use their own languages. So why is it that when it comes to Africa, we have to study in French, you know, before we, or we have to study English, in English before we can do it, because we're thinking that if we don't study English, we cannot go abroad, we can. If we study in our own language and we do well, they will come there to recruit us. And I was recruited from Ghana, you know, and, and it was because I knew I can, and I knew my English, and I knew my subject area. And so what I'm saying is that teach people mathematics in a can or in ever. You know, I'm sure that when, when people hear this, they're going to say that, oh, no, there are no textbooks. There are no, write them. If there are no textbooks, write those textbooks. You have teachers who can do it. Let them do it. Because that's the only way. Here's the problem. And I'm not saying this in a pejorative way. You know, when you go to Ghana, you, I mean, whenever you go, you listen carefully. People speak English with their kids, okay? Now, the language they are speaking with their kids, the English they are speaking with their kids is broken English. Okay, the grammar is terrible. No, I'm not kidding, okay? So here you are with a parent who, instead of helping the child by speaking Ghanaian language with the child, is speaking English with the child because the child goes to an experimental school or whatever school they call it, you know? It is idiotic. I'm sorry I'm using the word idiotic so many times, but I think our system is broken. It is broken because, you know, we hold on to things that do not belong to us and we think we have appropriated it. And sometimes we even think we speak and write better English than the native speakers. The native speakers don't care. In fact, my secretary, for example, spoke what I sometimes was thought was, you know, I mean, this is not good English. And there, there was one time she and I were talking, said, Sam, I'm a native speaker. And I said, I think you're right. Okay. We in Ghana, I mean, worry so much about grammar. You know, that if somebody says something which we think is grammatically incorrect, you become angry. Take the exams council. You know, I was an exa examiner for the West African Ambitions Council, English language. And we were testing these young people to speak like Brits. You know, of course, we would say that we're testing educated Ghanaian English, but it was nonsense. It wasn't educated Ghanaian English. We, were test we, were, we wanted them to speak like Brits, you know. What sense does that make? You know, and why do we put so much emphasis in someone else's language when that person doesn't care about our language? Africa can develop better if we teach our kids in our own languages. And if anybody tells you, you know, I mean, if you select one language, it is a foreign language, tell them they don't know what they are talking about. If they tell you that, you know, our kids, you know, we want, we all want to travel. Of course we want to travel. Who doesn't want to? I mean, traveling is part of human life. You know, throughout history, people have moved. Everybody moved out of Africa. I mean, we all lived in Africa and some moved away, you know? So, I mean, when somebody, for example, asks me, when are you leaving, when are you going home? I'm like, you didn't bring me here. I came by myself. I determine when I'm going back. If you go back, then I will go back, you know? So yes, people want to travel and people must travel. But, you know, the, the, the idea of traveling, you know, shouldn't form the basis of the language we use, you know. Um, I'm, of course, I'm a linguist, so I'm emphasizing that, you know, as much as I can, because I think that's a very big, you know, um, disservice we're doing to the kids, you know, t speaking with them in English and putting more emphasis on English instead of on the Guinean languages. Okay, right. So now, again, I'll go back to students who want to travel abroad. Mm -hmm. Because I, for instance, I completed my bachelor degree in 2010 and it was very difficult for me to get a job 
Mm-hmm. So I finally had to travel. Mm-hmm. So, Prof, what is your advice to these students? Because everybody wants to travel abroad. Because there is nothing is working in the country as I speak now. Yeah. So, what is your advice to these students? Okay. Now, first, let my advice should go to uh, my colleagues in Ghana. You know, people of my age. You know, <laughs> I mean, if the system is broken, it means we broke it, and we must fix it. <laughs> You know, and um, there are several ways of fixing it. You know, that we have to create jobs for the youth. You know, one of the mistakes we make, those of us who travel, and I've made that mistake, is that we go and build a huge house in Ghana that we will never live in. So it becomes something like um, a funeral home. You know, when you go to put your corpse there for maybe a two, three hours, and it will take you go and put you in the ground, okay, in a grave. All right? Now, that is totally nonsensical. Why would you invest in something that will not be beneficial to you? In fact, my kids asked me that question. They did, why are you building in Ghana? And I said, well, you see, everybody does it. And my, the last one is the one who asks me the most difficult question. But it doesn't make sense. I said, you're right, it doesn't make sense. But the, you know, the, the, this cultural conventions, which must be broken, we says, you've traveled, so you must come and build. I have a friend who is building a house and he's almost retiring. And I'm like, why? And it's because he says, if I don't build, when I die, they will insult me. And my my response to him was, well, you'll be dead. So even if they insulted you, you know, that wouldn't mean anything. You know, well, well, how do you, I mean, what do you care about when you're dead? People insulting you, you know, but that, that kind of cultural thing is there, you know. So first and foremost, let's establish businesses so that these young people will have work to do. And then, remember I mentioned our educational system. If we emphasize vocational education, I don't know about you, but when I was a child, when I was in primary school, middle school, we had about two hours of what we call craft. We, I mean, I learned how to weave a doormat from the husk of coconut, the coconut fruit, you know, the husk, we made doormat from it. We wove baskets. We wove kente in high school. You know, there was lessons on kente. So I know how to weave kente. So should everything fail whilst I'm here, I can go home and, you know, weave kente or make a doormats. And you know what? I'll, I'll probably go with a little bit of money. And so I, it can become a big company, you know, where we make doormats and all these other things. I can employ people. Instead of me going to build a house, you know, now somebody lives in the house and I pay electricity and water. Okay, so that, I don't have a brain, you know, and it's, it's not just me, you know, it's most of the people of my generation, you know, we, we, we didn't study enough economics, you know, because if we had, we would know that it's not a good business going to build a house when you won't live in it. If you rent it out to people, you should know that it will be ruined in two or three years, you send money to go and repair it. It's a useless investment, you know. And now the other the other side of it is, if we're going to encourage people to travel, and I believe in people traveling, I mean, it's part of human nature, then we must prepare them well to travel. And for one thing that my daughter has always suggested, as I said, I have three kids. I mean, my daughter is a surgeon, a physician, a surgeon. My son is a tenured professor. And uh, my, the last one is in the medical school. And uh, these guys advise me a lot. And what my daughter has been advising me about is, Daddy, why don't you go and establish something like Kaplan? You know, Kaplan, Kaplan, however you want to pro- produce, pronounce it. Where, you know, you employ qualified teachers to teach people how to do the GRE and TOEFL and all that. And I said, it's a good idea. It's a good idea, you know. So it's something that um, my daughter is insisting that I do. You know, I establish a school where I educate people solely and completely on passing the exam, you know, to travel. Those days when, I mean, there was the British Council exam. I don't know whether they still do it, you know. But, but um, you know, if it, the short of it is that we should prepare them. Because if we leave them on their own, because the educational system has been weak for a while, doing well in these exams is not easy. You know, so you have somebody who gets a first class, you know, and by the way, I hate the way my colleagues grade in Ghana. You know, I mean, if someone gets a first class and you look at their transcript, that person will get an ordinary pass here. 
you know. So, I mean, I remember when I taught at Legon, I'm not going to mention his name, I had a colleague who would never give anybody anything higher than a B. And I would ask him, why are you doing this? And he said, well, if I give someone an A, if the other person did better, what would I do? And I said, why well, don't, don't you have a marking scheme? You know, we, you shouldn't do impressionistic marking. You should do positive marking. Because if you do impressionistic marking, you know, you, if you're impressed by what the person has written, you give an A. But if you did positive marking, you know, then you're looking at the points, you know. And so the short of it is that, you know, people, I'm not saying they should give everybody an A, but if you look at the transcript from the US and you compare them with transcript from Africa and England, you know, you see that the grades are very, very low. And I'm sure the same with Belgium and France and all over the place, you know. I mean, you look at France, for example, to do a doctor, doctor dissertation, sometimes it can even be up to a thousand pages. Here, yeah, somebody does 150 and they are done. 150 pages and, you know, you know. So I, I, what I'm trying to say here is that let's make the educational system a little flexible. In fact, when I started teaching here, that was one of the problems I had. I was giving people 40%, you know. And so some, some, some of the students will come to me and say, Professor Ben, this is an F. I said, no, 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 it's a C, okay? So, and they said, well, if it's a C, then you have to give me 70 you know <laughs> here i'm talking about grid conversion so when somebody applies for example to our program i tell my colleagues if this person is coming from africa or europe know that you know the grades that they've been given you know do not reflect the person's ability you know so that's one thing my colleagues in ghana should kind of look at i'm sure you know there'll be people who will insult me for saying this um i taught in the system you know for seven years if somebody told me that i'll be mad you know but it's reality because if somebody gets a first class and degrees he has c's and d's and whatever have you i have a question you know i have a problem with that and then also i think um <laughs> this is a difficult thing to say but i'm going to say it anyway how on earth can someone have a class of a thousand students and tell me that learning is taking place? Okay? A thousand students, and you're telling me learning is taking place? I know that in, at Legon, you know? In fact, it's kind of funny because quite a number of people who are teaching there now were my former students. You know, I look at the linguistics department, you know, I taught almost everyone, including the vice chancellor, okay? <laughs> you know? And so, <laughs> What I tell what I tell them is, you know what, I don't like your grading system. You know, I also don't think that um, it is feasible to have a thousand students in a class, four hundred students in a class. You know, maybe you should have four people teach that class or divide that class into groups, because no real learning can take place. And I'm being very blunt here. You know, I tell them, you know, when, when I'm in Ghana, I tell my colleagues that one of the biggest problems I have. And, you know, this comes, you know, it goes into university ranking. Because if they know, for example, that the ratio, teacher-student ratio is that, you know, miserable, you're not going to have good ranking, you know. So the teacher-student ratio should be looked at. Now, someone is going to tell me that there are not enough faculty. That's true. This is where I would kind of uh, hold government to fire, hold their feet to fire. You know, why should lecturers, professors, why should they retire at 60? And then you give them a contract for 10 years. I mean, here I know people who are 80 who are still teaching. There's no retirement age. You know, you don't retire. You know, I mean, I'm 64 and I'm not thinking about retirement. That's why the fact that, you know, I've, I've been sick for a long time and, um, you know, I've recovered, you know, I'm not thinking about retirement. But then my colleagues in Ghana, have retired and they have to rely on the generosity of their colleagues, you know, to give them contract. You know, why should faculty retire? I mean, Nigeria, they retire at 65 and 70. Ghana is 60. And then, as I said, you have to look, you know, pray that you are not mean when you are a senior faculty so that your co junior colleagues will employ you. You know, I mean, government should look at that. People, those professors should not retire. You know, I mean, if you see that somebody is barely, you know, making it, you know, or they're becoming irresponsible by not teaching and stuff like that, then you can ask them to leave. 
but so long as they're teaching, you know, so all these are very important in preparing our students. You know, I mean, why can't, for example, those uh, who have age 60 and over, let them teach just PhD students, let them train the new generation of faculty. And then you don't have to have one person teaching a thousand students. You know, so in, in, in short, what I'm trying to say is that there's something fundamentally wrong with our educational system. And those, if we don't, you know, change those, you know, there's very little help we can give to those young people who want to travel. In fact, if there were enough faculty, if there were enough businesses, who would want to travel? I mean, here, when you come, you have to do twice, sometimes twice what the people here do to be recognized, you know, that you're here. You know, I've been very fortunate, you know, because things have worked well for me. But I've also seen the difficulty in working here, especially when you are in a leadership position, you know. And so, I mean, anytime my wife says this, and I think she's right, anytime we arrive in Ghana, you can breathe well, you can breathe easy. You know you are home. You know, you know, you can say whatever you want to say and, uh, you know, you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder, you know. So um, that's what I would say about that. So based on what you are saying, I'm coming to the performance level. Mm. When Ghanaian students, because I'm sure by now you've had a chance to supervise the Ghanaians who transition from Ghana to your university. How is yes. the performance level based on their transcripts? Uh, you mean performance level here in the U.S.? Well, I would say, uh, you know, they're doing well just like anybody else. I mean, uh, having seen uh, anybody you know, who I would say it wasn't passing, you know, I mean, everybody passes. Um, I mean, what, what, what I see is that uh, the, the preparation sometimes is a little weak. Because, I mean, when, when they come, you realize that they're not very strong in terms of theory. Uh, they're very good with description, you know, but description is not enough. They have to be able to theorize, you know, and I, I think it's also part of our educational system. We want to be taught. We don't want, you know, to be, um, we don't want, this is the wrong expression. Um, I mean, okay, let me say it anyway. You know, people don't want to use their heads, you know, and if you ask anybody who taught me, they will tell you, I mean, if you tell me uh, one plus one is two, I'm not going to take it unless you tell me why it is two. It's very important. That's one thing we should start kids, start teaching kids. You know, back home when some a child asks too many questions, we'll tell them to shut up, you know, and that's, that's the worst thing you can do to a human being because it kills initiative, it kills innovation. So the point I'm saying here is that um, let's encourage theorization. Let's people theorize. Let's people, you know, sit down and ask, okay, why are things happening the way they are? Is there something that can help to explain it, you know, as an umbrella thing to explain it? Because if all we're doing is describing what we're seeing, that's not enough, you know. Any good theory, should not only synthesize, it must analyze. You know, so this is very essential. So we have to take synthesis and analysis. And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, we can all do. I mean, anybody, you know, in the past, you didn't need a, a, even a master's degree to teach at the university. You know, people with bachelors became full professors. You know, you take Legum, for example, Professor Nketia had his back, only a BA, Professor Dixon had a BA, Professor Poker had a BA. You know, they didn't need an MA to teach. In fact, it was the, the, the joke was that if your BA was bad, then you did an MA. But if you had a very good BA, that was enough, you know. So what, what I'm trying to say here is that we must make the BA strong. You know, the bachelors should be very strong. If someone says they have a bachelor's degree, then, you know, that person should be seen as an intellectual. And they can only be seen as an intellectual if we reduce the student-faculty ratio. Because if it is 100,000 people in one class, how are you going to teach it? Can you give, you cannot give any individualized attention, you know, and that's very bad. And so that's one thing I would suggest, you know, uh, making sure that uh, the teaching we're doing, you know, is effective. It shouldn't be lectures. I don't like the word lecturer, you know, it shouldn't be lectures, you know. It should be, what, synthesis, it should be analysis, it should be experiential. People should be able to go to class and talk. They read, 
They go, they discuss stuff, and they challenge the teacher. This is very important. For every 10 students you teach, one is more intelligent than you. Look for that one person and let make that person part of the class. You know, and but then if, if you go to class and all you do is amorphous kind of teaching, you are the boss, you wear your coat and you, you're not helping. You know, so it is very, very essential that um, we, 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 we look at our educational system, you know, especially performance is very important. It shouldn't just be the students performing well, it should be the teachers also. How can we ensure that the teachers are teaching well? Peer observation is very important. Peer observation is important. So it's not just the students who should evaluate the teachers. And I'm, I'm sure they're doing it now. You know, it, should, it shouldn't just be the students evaluating the teachers. Your colleagues should also evaluate you because that's very, very essential. And it shouldn't be done in such a way that you have the senior person telling the junior person what to do. It should be interactional. So I come to your class, you know, maybe you and I go have a beer and we talk about it. If you don't drink beer, you can have coffee or tea, you know, or go eat for food, you know, and then talk about it. You know, that, well, you know, this was not so good. Maybe you can improve upon this, you know. And then also let the junior people also go to the senior people's class. So it shouldn't be one way. I come and observe you. You come to my class and observe me and ask me questions also. You know, that's very essential. Okay, I think our time is going up. Um, so my last question is, what do you look out for when you are taking a student into your class or into your research? What do you look out for? Okay. Thank you very much. It's a very good question. The first thing I look out for is background preparation and interest. Do they have the necessary background preparation? You know, now linguistics is said that you don't have to have a BA in linguistics to do graduate work in linguistics. You know, you, you can just come in and do a master's in linguistics. It's a little harder, but then it's still doable. So I look at their background preparation. We've had students who have come to our program with a degree in mathematics, you know, with a degree in chemistry, and they've come and flourished. So what background does a person have? And then, you know, what interest do they have? That's very, very important. You know, do they, for example, are they interested in phonetics? Are they interested in pragmatics? Are they interested in African linguistics? Then you, I mean, when they write a statement of objective, and I always tell people that write a good statement of objective when you are applying, because that's like your card to the place. In fact, in our department, we, some of us have fought so hard, now we don't look at TOEFL or GRE anymore. So, we, because it's a stupid test. I mean, all those tests are useless. I mean, um, we look at your statement of objective. You know, have you identified a professor that you want to work with? Because that's a motivation. When I look at someone's application, they say they want to work with me, immediately I begin to look up for them. Can I get them a scholarship? You know, can I do this for them? I've brought people from Africa. In fact, um, I, two years ago, I brought, no, last year I brought someone from Nigeria. Uh, this year I brought someone from Ghana. You know, I, I mean, I, I bring a lot of people. Most importantly, I look at what they want to do. Can I help them? You know, and um, will they survive the graduate program? That is very, very important. And so you look at, for example, did they write a long essay? As far as I'm concerned, did the person write a long essay? Um, what kind of long essay did the person write? If they didn't write a long essay, what kind of subjects did they do? You know, um, would that be helpful, you know, in graduate school? And then the most important is when they come, you have to mentor them. Mentoring is very, very important. In fact, I mentor a lot of people. In fact, that's why I've, I've supervised uh, more than 70 I believe now the last matter was about 60 something, almost 70 dissertations. You know, so I work with a lot of people. And what I look at for, sometimes I chat, sometimes I just serve on it, you know, people from all over the place. You know, in fact, most of my students are, are Americans, obviously. And then I have a few from Asia, a few from Africa and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I look at their background and I say, okay, how can I help them? So if we form your advisory committee. Okay, and then you determine who should come on the committee. You ask the student, you know, what's your interest? Because people's interests change. And when that happens, you have to help that person to transition from your care to another person's care. You know, it's very, very essential. So that if somebody, for example, comes in, 
initially they want to do African linguistics, but then change their minds and want to do computational linguistics where they write software. I mean, they can get a job much easier in that area. They have to help them by introducing them to a faculty member, you know, so that I mean, they can transition. So that, that, that's the kind of thing I look out for. Okay, Professor Obinjesi, thank you so much. Um, I'll come your way again for sure. Well, I know you you have a lot to tell us. I'll come your way. I will find time and send you email. Then you schedule another meeting. So thank you so much for your time. We are very much grateful, and I believe my audience are going to learn. They're going to learn from what about you told us today. Thank you so much, Professor Jesse. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a You're pleasure. Welcome.